If you don't know me, my name's Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here at, uh, at Crestwood. And I want to ask you this. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel overwhelmed by the news? I think some of us maybe experienced a little bit of that this week. That's a, and I think for most people, it's a question that's really only legitimately existed for maybe 20 years. When I, when I was a kid, I had a, I had a paper route. And if you're, if you're younger than 20, I might, I might need to explain this. When I was a kid, newspapers weren't just old news companies with a website, right? The Globe and Mail and the Wall Street Journal were, were actual physical newspapers that were, that were delivered to doors all around the country. And so, uh, so our, our local paper was printed six days a week. And so I'd get a bundle of them delivered to my house in the afternoon. And when I came home from school, I'd put them in a bag and I'd hop on my bike and I'd go deliver them door to door in the sunshine and the rain and the snow, whatever. Most people learned about the news of the world from the paper, and maybe from the evening newscast, a, a one-hour program on one of the networks. And so that was it. You read the paper, you got one hour of news, and then you spent the rest of your day at work or at school or with your family or whatever else you were doing. Your, your intake of what was going on in the world around you was mostly limited to an hour, maybe two, in the day where you were consuming that information. You learned a little bit that was going on locally, a few things going on nationally, maybe one or two international stories, the sports scores, the stock prices, who had died in your town the day before, and that was it. Now, you learn about everything that's going on everywhere. You're not just responsible to learn about a few things that affect you, you're learning about everything that happens. And then, and then there are a hundred opinion pieces written from all different perspectives on any given event to let you know what you're supposed to think about it. And most of the stuff that gets attention is bad news. So you're bombarded with information about wars and famines and pandemics and insurrections and racism and conspiracies and murders and cover-ups all the time. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by it? Like there's just, there's just too much evil in the world for you to be able to, to comprehend, to deal with. Like there's too much evil and not enough good. That it just keeps happening and it never seems to stop. If you have ever felt that way, ever felt overwhelmed by the evil in the world around you, if you have ever cried out to God in that sorrow, then you can already identify with the book of the prophet Habakkuk. And by the way, Pastor Chris and I are both going to be preaching this series, and I think we might pronounce it differently. Some say Habakkuk, some say Habakkuk. They're both right, so please don't be distracted by it. Let's not divide the church over the right way to say Habakkuk, even though it's Habakkuk. But, uh... <laughs> all right, so we're starting a new series. We're going to go through this book, the book of the prophet Habakkuk. He was a prophet in Judah, the southern kingdom. He talks about the eventual rise of the Chaldeans or the, the Babylonians. So he's writing sometime before the Babylonians take Judah into exile. But aside from that clue... The book doesn't tell us exactly when it was written or who the king was. We just know that it was written during a time where there was a lot of evil, not only in the world around them, not only in the nations out there, but within the nation of Israel, within the people of God. Habakkuk describes what that looks like a little bit in our passage this morning. He makes it clear that things were bad. He describes the world of his fellow countrymen as violent, as iniquitous, as full of wrongdoing and destruction. He says there is strife and contention, that the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth, that the, that the wicked outnumber the righteous, that they surround them and threaten them, and that even basic attempts to do what is right are thwarted. 
It's bad. It's evil. It's cause for despair. And it's been like this for some time. So in, 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 in the opening verses of the book, Habakkuk teaches us what to do when we're overwhelmed by the happenings of the world around us. He gives us an example in the, in the first four verses of what it looks like to lament. We cry out to God in anger, in frustration, in confusion. This is literally how the book begins. So let's start. We're going to read Habakkuk 1 and the first four verses. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we live in a world, and, and frankly right now, we live in a time where we experience great frustration, confusion, anger, exhaustion, impatience. So Lord, teach us, teach us to channel those things into faithful lament. To take our frustrations and bring them to your throne. To bring our anger to your throne, our confusion to your throne. Not to let it drive us away from you or away from who you have made us to be, but rather to have it draw us closer to you. to entrust the things that we don't know, to entrust the things that frighten us, anger us, make us anxious to you, to your goodness, to your power, wisdom, and providence. So as we open this book this morning, as we, as we look to events that happened thousands of years ago, to a book that was written by a man that we don't know that much about, except that he's our family, except that he is your prophet, except that you speak through him. So teach us. Open our hearts to your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. These opening four verses of, of, of Habakkuk tell us many things, but they tell us at least three things about what lament is, about what Habakkuk's example of lament for us here is. And the first, the, the first is that lament is faithful. Lament is faithful. Look at the second verse. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Notice who Habakkuk is talking to. He's talking to God, okay? He's complaining to be sure. He has a whole list of grievances about what's happening in the world around him. But it's not driving him away from God. It's driving him to God. He's complaining to God about what's happening around him. He's not complaining to the world around him about God. You see the difference? The temptation when things go wrong is is to decide that God is no longer good or that he never was in the first place. To see horrible things happening around us or to us and say, 
God isn't there, or God isn't good, or God doesn't care about us. Notice that that Habakkuk isn't just lamenting about God. He is addressing his entire prayer to God. He is expecting an answer. He is expecting God to explain what's happening in the world around him to him. And he's been doing it for a while. One of the questions that Habakkuk asks is, how long shall I cry for help and you do not hear? That question, how long, suggests that Habakkuk has been making this prayer for a while, that things have been bad for a long time, and Habakkuk has been asking God, why is this happening? God, why did the wicked outnumber the righteous? Why, even when we go to the courts, is law paralyzed so that nothing good ever comes out of it? And no answer. Habakkuk expects an answer. Even though there's been silence for some time, he believes that God is good and that he'll eventually act, that he'll eventually answer. He believes that God is powerful to change the course of Israel's history. Otherwise, there's no use in making this prayer. Otherwise, it's useless. It's just noise up into the air. But it's clear that Habakkuk's complaint is full of faith. He's willing to be patient for it. He's willing to wait for it. But he expects God to act. He expects God to answer. This is the difference between faithful lament and faithless rejection of God. It's become a thing in evangelical circles over the last five years, maybe, for there to be deconversion stories. So everybody who's a believer has a, or at least people who come to faith maybe later in life when they're a little bit older, they have a conversion story, right? They have a story about how it was that they, that they came to recognize that they were sinners, that they needed Jesus, and that, uh, and that atonement and forgiveness and the love of God is provided through Jesus himself at at the cross. Everybody has a conversion story, but there's been this trend over the last few years to have deconversion stories, that professing Christians will go through a crisis of faith on some moral issue, or, or they see ugly things happening in their church, or some other major negative thing happens, or they just change their mind and figure that it wasn't true to begin with, or at least that their faith as they understood it was completely wrong. And so the end result is they end up telling a long story to the rest of the world about how they decided that God isn't really there. They were wrong all along, and now they've seen the foolishness of their former faith. And every few months, it seems, a former name in evangelicalism has one of these stories. But these are the exact opposite of what Habakkuk is doing. I think sometimes we've been given the impression that asking questions like the ones that Habakkuk is offering here is somehow impious, somehow doesn't trust God's wisdom or his goodness or his power. To say, we know you are good, we know you're powerful, we know you are there, and yet look at all this stuff that's happening. It feels... It feels disrespectful, maybe, to God, like it's irreverent in some way, but it's not. It's not. Because the way that Habakkuk goes about it is full of faith. I see all this stuff happening, and I don't understand it, but I know you're there. So tell me why. How long is this going to go on for? Habakkuk's lament isn't the rejection of faith, it's the practice of it. God, you're good, so why is there so much evil among your people? God, you're powerful, so why do the wicked profit so much all of the time? Those are the cries of someone with deeply Christian commitments wrestling with the realities of this world. 
It means that if you've ever felt this, if you've ever wondered about the wisdom of God's plan in the world, it means if, if you don't understand how His goodness can match up with some of the things that we see happening around us, you're not faithless because of it. It doesn't mean you're unspiritual. It doesn't mean that you've somehow sinned or offended against God. It simply simply matters. It simply means that you are taking the truths, the things that you know to be true about God, His power and His goodness, and asking how they make sense of the world around you. We can't let those things drive us away from God. But if they pull us towards Him, if they make us pray to Him and ask Him questions, lament the way that things are to Him, that's not faithless. It's faithful. Which brings us to the second thing. Lament is pleasing to God. Look at the first verse. This is one of the sort of, uh, the sort of thing that often introduces a prophecy in the Old Testament, and so we kind of skip over it. But the first verse says, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. That it's an oracle means that what's happening in this book isn't just sort of Habakkuk's own private prayer journal, his own fallible thoughts and opinions and prayers. That it's an oracle means that it was given to him as God's appointed prophet. It means that in the New Testament, when Peter says that that the prophets of the Old Testament didn't just write themselves, but were carried along as God inspired them, and as Paul talks about how all Scripture is breathed out by God, it's talking about what's happening here with Habakkuk. That everything that Habakkuk writes, not just God's answers to him, which are going to come in the the following verses, it's not only when God speaks in the book, but also when Habakkuk speaks that were revealed to him by God. He isn't merely recording his own thoughts and prayers, it's, it's revelatory. It's given to him by God. His complaints and prayers in the book come from God himself. When Habakkuk asks how long and why, and and he says, look at the world around me, look at how things are. God gave that to him. Which means that God is teaching us how to lament and how to process evil in the world around us through Habakkuk. It means the kind of lament that Habakkuk models for us isn't only faithful in its example, which it is, it's also pleasing to God. God isn't capable of sinning. So if he reveals these words and gives this response to Habakkuk, it's, necessary, it's necessarily good and pleasing to him. People do things in the Bible all the time that aren't good, right? Not everything that happens in the story of Scripture is meant to be repeated or modeled by us. Not everything is an example to us of something that's good for us to do. Right? A classic example is the, the patriarchs in the Old Testament taking multiple wives for themselves. We see them doing it, and yet we know that in the beginning, God says to the first man and the first woman, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Right? The idea of marriage, the purpose of marriage, the God-ordained way that marriage is meant to happen is that there is to be one man 
and one woman who are unified to the exclusion of all others. So not everything that happens in the Bible is meant to be repeated by us. The Bible does tell us about sinful things that even some of its heroes do. But here in Habakkuk, what Habakkuk does and says is given to him directly by God. It is an oracle. It is revelation of God himself. And so, what Habakkuk does in his lament is he shows us something faithful, something that is pleasing to God. That lament, bringing our anger, our frustration, our confusion about the world around us to God, is an act of worship. And the last thing, third thing. First, lament is faithful, and lament is pleasing to God. Last thing, lament reminds us who God is. Look again at verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? We mentioned earlier that this is a prayer that Habakkuk has been making for some time. Maybe it's been weeks or months, maybe it's even been years that things have been bad in Judah and Habakkuk has been asking the Lord, how long is it going to be like this? Maybe he's been asking for years before answers finally begin to come in this book, before God responds. Which means, for however long that Habakkuk's been lamenting this way, up to this point, the answer from God has been silence. Nothing. Not a word of revelation. No changes in the conduct of Israelite society. No improvement in their obedience. Just nothing. Silence. And yet Habakkuk keeps lamenting. He keeps praying. He keeps bringing his, his anxieties to the Lord. That's the way it is, I think, most of the time when we lament. Sometimes in Scripture, God may answer some of our questions about why certain things happen. Sometimes some, some aspects of His providence become clearer to us as time goes on. But often there's no direct answer to these types of questions. And His silence to Habakkuk was a tacit call to trust him. Even though there was no answer until this point in the book, even though there had been silence for a long time, Habakkuk kept praying, kept asking, kept trusting. If, it weren't, if that weren't the case, Habakkuk would have given up his prayers long before he got to write this book. But the silence of God isn't the absence of God. It's an invitation to trust Him. Lamenting and not getting an answer or perhaps not getting the one that we want is essentially God saying, you don't need to know every answer for you to continue to trust me. Because that's what Habakkuk did. He kept praying kept asking. The theological truths that lament makes us repeat to ourselves are a lot like a, a regular conversation that one of my pastor friends has from time to time with one of his daughters. Kids play, right? Kids fall down and get hurt. They scrape their knee. And so uh, one, of, one of my pastor friend's kids hates getting rubbing alcohol on her scrapes because it hurts. So often when something like that happens and he's got to clean the wound, she's, she's panicking before he puts the disinfectant on because she knows that it's going to hurt. And so there's this conversation that he's told me that they regularly have. He says, I don't say this won't hurt because that's a lie. It is going to hurt. And I don't say, okay, I won't do it, because I have to do it. But I ask questions. I ask her, do I love you? She says, yes. I ask, do you think I want to hurt you? She says, 
no. He says, do you know I'm trying to help you? She says, yeah. So he says, then trust me. The end goal of our lament isn't for us to know the inner workings of God's wisdom and providence. He just doesn't tell us those things. Those are some of the secret things that belong to God and not to us. The things that He knows that He's decided not to reveal to us. The things that are too wonderful and too high and too many and too deep for us to peer into. The end goal isn't for us to become privy to every aspect of God's eternal decrees for the outworkings of our world. The end goal is for us to remember who He is and what He's like. That He loves us. That He's not trying to hurt us or destroy us. That He's good and He wants what's best for us. That He's powerful to do what's right. And then to trust Him. Let's pray. Father, when we are afraid, confused, frustrated, or anxious, let it drive us to you in prayer, in lament. We don't need to hold back, hold back, but we can, we can list everything that is wrong with the world around us and everything wrong with our own hearts to you openly honestly, that this is pleasing to you, that this is faithful. But when we do so, remind us of why we ask, of why we pray, because you are there, because you are good and strong. And even if there is no answer that satisfies our questions in the moment. Help us to trust you. That we don't need to know every answer. That we don't need to give our okay to your reasons. But that you are trustworthy. So we trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.